This is John Cola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. In this episode, we're going to answer your guys' questions in a, I like to do monthly, Q&A session. If you do have a question for me, um, I will have a link down below so you could go to my YouTube comments page and post the question uh, that I, I, if you post it there, then I select from those questions to appear in next month's Q&A. I apologize in advance if you contact me through different social media outlets, even leave comments under videos. I just can't respond. I have over 100,000 followers on this YouTube channel, and you know I have very limited time to do, do everything I need to do in life, including make my juice, do all my gardening, get my work done, fix my house. I had to fix a leaky shower today and fix a door handle that wasn't working. <laughs> so, and I got to do laundry next, and I got a garden. So, yeah, I apologize. I can't answer everybody. Um, I do have a way. If you do need to contact me, I do have a way for just. Uh, Five bucks plus service fee. You can talk to me for 10 minutes. I'll answer any questions that you have for me that I'm able. I'll post a link down below to that. That's I call it a garden coaching session, but basically I'll talk about anything that I know about. And I don't have the answer to everything, but I've been doing this for a while, so I know a lot. All right, and then any money that comes into me from the Fiverr campaign, uh, it doesn't get cashed out by me. It goes back into the Fiverr community to help get my videos transcribed, which I've been actually behind on. Um, so that people that do not speak English can get it translated into foreign languages and or for the hearing impaired. So I thank you guys for those of you guys have, that have done that for me. Anyways, uh, next let's get on to the questions today. First question is from E. Dallo. How long should you wait after finishing a juice? Uh, so like I guess that's how long to wait after finishing a juice before you eat anything. So you know generally I like to extend the time as much as possible but then sometimes like you know I'm in a rush or something so in general I like to say I mean they say juices digest within 15 minutes so you know that might be the low end if you if you have to eat or something and you're getting on an airplane you gotta eat some stuff before you go to the TSA or something um, generally I like to wait about half hour to 45 minutes or maybe like an hour I mean that's a rough gauge um, to tell you all right and also, you know, I, I would not just like, oh, it's been a half hour, I'm going to eat. I want you guys to actually to check in with your body to see if you are actually hungry or not. <coughs> Even if you just had a juice, you know, maybe you're not hungry. You should just, oh, it's 30 minutes, I'm going to eat because I need to eat something next. Like, don't eat because it's noon, don't eat because it's 8, don't eat because it's 5 o'clock and it's dinner time. Eat when your body tells you you're hungry. And the sensation you're going to get is not in your stomach. It's going to happen in your, either in your mouth. Or your throat and uh, you know this may take some time to key in on and learn about but I want you guys to pay attention to your body and what it needs and, and listen you know and be open to listening next question is from a starshine love light lover <laughs> what is the best method for storing celery do you chop it before you store it if it goes limp do you put it in water before you juice it or do you just juice it limp thanks always enjoy your channel all right, so my goal is to never buy more celery than I need that I'm going to use within the next few days. Um, you know, there are always exceptions to, all, <clears throat> to basically almost all my rules. And the exception for that rule is if it's on sale. So like if it's on sale, it's on sale, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago for 99 cents and that sale lasted a week and then after that the price skyrocketed back up to two, three dollars a head. I basically bought like 30 heads as much as I could fit in my fridge. And so I think the, the tips for storing it as long as possible, number one, are keep the fridge cold. So I like to keep the fridge that I store my celery in around 34, 36 degrees. Other thing is keep them celery, they'll keep them moist or keep them sealed in the bag that they come in uh, with a few holes in it or put them in your own bag or put them in your crisper, crisper drawer if you have one. Um, that'll help keep them fresher longer and use them before they wilt, right? If they wilt, depending on how bad the wilt is, generally on a celery I'll usually pull off some of the outer stalks that kind of look messed up, that are cracked, that may be turning a little bit more, you know, light colored than darker colored, you know. Um, I just usually compost those because I don't want to juice those and put them into me. If it's, if it's like wilting a little bit, 
then I will juice it if it's wilting really bad then I'm just gonna take it off and I'm gonna like basically throw it in my compost for my worm bins you know a big part of my life and what, what I like to teach is to eat the freshest highest quality produce as possible right I have celery growing behind me actually right here it's going to flower I have a video where I, I make the most nutritious celery juice in my estimation in the world post a link down below to that on my other YouTube channel and uh, you know I don't like harvest this celery put it inside my fridge wait a week or two weeks or three weeks and then juice it no I, I harvest this fresh and I get it, it gets washed and it goes right in my juicer to make the juice fresh so I really want to encourage you guys you know don't buy more celery than you really could actually use in a, in a specific amount of time unless it's something like on sale and you're gonna get an amazing deal you know I've also by accident frozen celery and I don't try to thaw it and juice it. If it gets frozen, I guess you could freeze it. And if it is frozen, keep it frozen and then use it in soups or stews if you guys cook. For me, uh, the, the, the thawed celery was just nasty. It basically got composted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I guess that's the thing. Oh, and do not chop your celery before you store it. Very important. <laughs> you know, I don't want to damage any of the cell walls. I don't want to break open any cell walls. It's like if you cut open an apple and you store it in the fridge for overnight it's gonna to start to turn brown that's oxidation occurring you're lowering nutrients by doing that so you know uh, also storing celery try to get the whole celery stocks not the celery hearts the celery hearts you know are not gonna be uh, not gonna store as long just because you know they're already cut back a lot from what there was on the plants in addition when buying your celery and I have a video on um, you know celery and the best use for celery and I go over my celery selection tips but when you guys are buying the celery, it's very important to get the freshest celery as possible. So pick it up and get the one that's heaviest for its weight. I've noticed lately some of the celery being sold is some of the like really low end, low grade celery because I think they're running out. And you know, it's really light. Uh, there's few stocks on it. And that's just not fresh. It's been sitting around. It's been transported from Mexico for too long. It's been in a re refrigerated warehouse too long. It's already starting to kind of lose its life force energy so I want you guys to eat life force energy so try not to store your celery you know for more than a week maybe you go shopping once a week I would encourage you to go to shopping at least twice a week maybe even you know if, if, if the store is on the way home go shopping every day to get the freshest stuff and then juice that the next day I mean I always like to teach good better best and the best of course is growing your own and even I don't grow all my celery I have a, I have a, I have a celery planted and I juice it occasionally but for the most part when I'm juicing celery and I've been on a celery hiatus lately because the price has gone up so much um, you know I try to buy it regularly and actually the tip on that is go to Whole Foods Whole Foods in my opinion has negotiated rates with the farmers so that their organic celery price because they just lowered their prices on a lot of produce items including celery and uh, garlic and ginger which is actually the lowest price at Whole Foods now instead of calling them whole paycheck um, I think several things are still expensive there, but the celery is probably the cheapest place you can find organic celery, all right? Enough on that question, let's go to the next one. George Kelly, how to wash, remove pesticides in a massive amounts of fruits and veggies if you're a raw vegan. I use vinegar plus Himalayan salt, it takes a lot of time. Is there any electrical device like a washing machine or something to speed up the process? All right, George, so number one is I'll tell you that I haven't really concerned myself too much about having to wash massive amounts of pesticides off my produce because I pretty much buy organic. That being said, there are, or, are organic pesticides applied to organic produce, which in, in many cases, in my opinion, hopefully are uh, less toxic to us. But if you're still buying conventional, then that would be a major consideration and factor for me. Um, that being said, I don't really have to do this. You know, generally I just wash everything with a, under, the, under the sink, spraying the water on it hard, if I had to do something else, then I might use some kind of like salt bath. Um, that being said, I do also have this thing called uh, uh, ultrasonic and ozone vegetable washing machine. So if I have like particularly dirty produce from my garden that has maybe lots of aphids, you know, I put it in an ozone bath, which is basically been proven by the FDA, uh, you know, for sanitation reasons to like basically kill E. coli and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if the unit that you're buying is actually making the ozone at proper dilution ratios uh, so that's how to sterilize stuff if you want to make sure it's sterilized that being said I believe also on the flip side there are beneficial microbes on plants that we don't want to sterilize the heck out of 
but of course we want to get rid of the bad things so that we don't get sick you know um, when eating produce now the next thing besides just the the microbes the ozone does uh, you know there's the ultrasonic so the ultrasonic is like a vibrator it's like a micro vibrator if you ever saw like a ultrasonic jewelry cleaner right it works by micro vibrating the the dirt literally off the jewelry to make your jewelry sparkle and clean again you could go to harbor freight and buy a really inexpensive one you know uh, but they do have ones that actually combine the ultrasonic with the ozone for cleaning your vegetables now what's the efficacy of cleaning your vegetables in the ozone and the ultrasonic I, I don't believe I've seen any studies maybe I looked it up one night maybe there's a few things that says it kind of helps so I will think that you know in my belief I think it's it can only be helpful it's not gonna make your produce any dirtier after it comes out of the ultrasonic then and the ozone I would then additionally wash it in addition and you may want to do a pretreatment step you know like soak it in your uh, you know vinegar and salt you know and then do the other things and just experiment because like I don't really know the the proper answer for you I'm just telling you guys what I have used in the past and, and do use on some occasions but most of the time if it comes out of my garden I basically just uh, you know wash it and just eat it and most of the produce I buy is organic so I just wash it and eat it I don't have any kind of intricate way to um, you know sterilize it but I do agree with removing the pesticides if you are buying conventional um, that is very important depending on the crop and then also pesticides can be also systemic so please keep in mind that I always encourage you guys to try to support and buy organic whenever you guys can or even better yet grow your own so you exactly know what's sprayed or not sprayed <laughs> on your produce just the other day I sprayed something on this stuff but it was high pressure water actually with a sprayer hose oops right there <laughs> to basically blast off my bugs all right uh, let's see here next question is from IR Passy not hi John I'm curious what you do for vitamin b12 since it's my understanding that we could only get it naturally by way of various meats thanks all right so you know that that in my opinion is false um, you know in nature we would get b12 from like something like dirty water or a stream b12 comes from bacteria um, it's not coming from animals how the animals get it is they basically eat bacteria um, you know, if they're eating, uh, you know, free range, you know, for example, they're eating grass, they're getting with the roots, and then the B12 is being made by the bacteria in the meats, and then the meats concentrate the bacteria, the B12 in their flesh, you know, which is what we're supposed to do if we have a source of water, like that's how we would have got it in the olden days before modern days, before we had all the sanitation, and that's why I'm not a big fan of super cleaning stuff hardcore before eating it um, but on the other hand you want to make sure it's clean enough so that you don't get sick from it so there's like a, you know balance or there's not chemtrails overhead that are landing on my stuff and I, I definitely want to wash those off before I eat it you know so once again I just rinse things off so yeah that's how we would get it naturally is by basically uh, dirty water that being said you probably want to be concerned about drinking dirty water now because maybe in the old days there was an overabundance of beneficial microbes in the environment and now there seems to be a overabundance of bad microbes in the environment especially from all the manure contamination from factory farming and all these things uh, plus animals are no longer eating their proper diets and also animals don't have proper microbiome that would naturally generally balance themselves out so they're not pooping out bad microbes right and so we've kind of messed the world up so um, so that being said you know I do take a b12 supplement I do rotate the different brands I use over the times over the you know times I had one I liked and then I had to change that up uh, because they changed their formulation I like to take a combination supplement with uh, methyl cobalamin adenzo cobalamin um, and the different forms and the cyano cobalamin just to make sure in addition, I eat fermented foods, which may contain B12, but I don't eat fermented foods to get my B12, very important distinction, as well as I have algae products that may also contain B12, such as chlorella and maybe spirulina, although they may be analogs. In addition, whenever I'm able, I eat fresh seaweeds, which may also have B12, although dehydrated seaweeds uh, you know, probably don't have B12 in it. That being said, I don't rely on those. I take a B12 supplement to make sure I get it. The other things I have looked into is, you know, I have looked into actually 
um, fortifying my soils with the special bacteria that actually make B12 and actually I put some of those very bacteria that will make basically make B12 as a byproduct is basically what they poop out as a layman's understanding um, you know in my soil so that maybe the microbes in my garden are putting out B12 and then maybe it'll be absorbed by my plants so maybe when I eat my plants I might get B12 that way you know once again I'm not guaranteeing that I'm doing this this is how I'd like to think things would happen I haven't tested anything like this at, at present time uh, to know that it's happening so I take a supplement in the long run all right next question is from midwife Alina I've heard you diss processed pet foods so I'm curious what does your dog eat so last video I po uh, I posted a video on I talk more about what my dog eats but in a nutshell you know, I don't rec I dis like processed, packaged, kibble foods, uh, you know, just as much as I would dis process vegan junk food products, Triscuits, Cheerios, or other packaged foods that are highly processed. Once we start processing foods, we lose a lot of different nutrients, although some are concentrated. You know, some of the concentrated nutrients are the main macronutrients, protein, fat, and uh, carbohydrates are concentrated in processed foods, but what's being lost are the phytonutrients and phytochemicals. Um, you know, in addition, you're losing all the enzymes in most processed foods, um, you know, dog foods, and ca as well as cat foods. You know, so I don't, I think animals and us, we should all eat our natural diets or as close to as possible. Of course, you know, people say dogs are carnivores, and I actually say they're mostly carnivorous, but can. Uh, are also omnivorous <laughs> and they can't handle vegetables so um, specifically what I feel feed my dog is what I eat so I eat a nutrient-dense plant-based diet he eats what I mean if he if I'm eating jackfruit like yesterday he got jackfruit you know uh, I ate a salad last night with sprout with with a, a bloomed wild rice and a nut sauce with you know vegetables out of my garden he got some of that right um, he also got my juice pulp from yesterday, you know, my carrot juice and, you know, uh, the juice pulp from pears. He didn't like that so much. So then when he doesn't like something that I make from, then I doctor it up. And I had to doctor this, the mixture up, the juice mixture up and the pulp mixture three times. Because at first I added some of his regular uh, dog food, which is basically a dehydrated um, or freeze dried raw dog food. So it's basically raw uh, meats with lots of vegetables and also the different you know vitamins and minerals they've identified that dogs need I don't think it'd be right to feed a dog entirely vegan without supplementation I believe they may be deficient but there are companies out there that make if you want to feed your dog vegan that's great you guys could do that but you want to make sure you get this special dog you know fortification powder product that you put in uh, you know to make sure your dog or your, your, your uh, cat gets everything it needs cats a bit more hard to be vegan they need a amino acid called taurine that may be deficient in most vegan foods although it may be in cactus fruit juice which also my dog gets he gets uh, taurine in his in the cactus fruit juice that I make if that in fact is actually in there some of the reports I've seen says cactus fruits have taurine and some of them say it doesn't so uh, let's see so yeah my dog eats uh, basically oh so then I had to doctor up the carrot juice with his dog food which then he still didn't eat and then I put in some Bonito fish flakes, which is actually cat treats I got for like a dollar, just 100%. Freeze dried, actually. He usually likes that. He didn't like, he still didn't eat it. I'm like, man, I'm not wasting this. So then finally I got out a can of tuna and poured in the tuna juice, tuna packed in water, and a little bit of the tuna in there. And then he ate the vegetables. So my goal is to feed my dog as much vegetables as he can tolerate. And then sometimes I have to add a little bit of meat so he actually eats the vegetables. But most of the time, he's happy eating the vegetables. <laughs> So yeah, that's what he eats, you know, and I, I supplement feed some of his raw dog foods, dehydrated dog foods, um, just because they have the different, you know, vitamins and minerals that he may need to be, so that he isn't deficient. In addition, I have also supplements for him. He, he takes an enzyme product, he takes a probiotic product, he takes kelp on a regular basis. Um, you know, there's a whole line of things I do. It's not just, oh, I feed him raw and that's it, no. You know, I want to make sure he's the healthiest he could be. Sometimes he gets like omega-3, like I've got salmon oil and he's gotten like freeze-dried salmon. He gets different treats when I go to the Whole Foods and I feel like standing in the deli counter line, I'll get him 
just piece little sample cups of salmon or or tuna. You know, that being said, for the most part, he eats mostly plant foods, and not just plant foods, but high nutrient dense plant foods. You know, I don't, I tend to feed him a lot of vegetables and fruits is what I'm eating. So by default, he gets that too. And let me tell you, when he poops jackfruit, it looks really funny because it makes it almost looks like jackfruit. But you can tell it's partially digested jackfruit. But he sure heck of a lot loves uh, eating it. All right. And then he says, uh, "Do you have any recommendations for cats?" I, I have uh, basically, I have no recommendations for cats. When I did have a cat, um, I forget what the cat would eat now. We would basically just feed him what we're, what we're eating and maybe like a specialized raw cat food. Oh, and actually like uh, tuna and other animal, um, you know, animals. So you wouldn't necessarily do that if you're a hardcore vegan or not. But, you know, I like to... Anyways, watch the video down below. I'll link it down below. It's basically why I'll never make a video. Why I'll, why, why I'll never make a video that says why I'm no longer vegan. All right? I go over this in more detail in that episode. All right? Let's see. Next question is from Curly Girl. If you were to add a probiotic drink into your daily consumption, what would it be? Also, how would that change your juicing routine? All right, so easy easy question first. How would that change my juicing routine? Probably wouldn't change my juicing routine, right? When I juice, oftentimes I'll pick items from my yard. They have naturally occurring probiotics on them, you know, that are just floating in from the air. Plus, I basically uh, spray compost tea and beneficial microbes, which are basically probiotics on my plants so that I'm going to get them. If I did want to juice and get a probiotic rich, which I have done in the past, I could make sauerkraut out of any of the, you know, most of my, most of the greens in my garden, or I can make some kind of fermented vegetable using only water. Ferment those vegetables. You could use salt or not. Salt is not required, according to Sandor Katz, the expert that wrote the book on, well, in my opinion, he's the expert that wrote the book on fermentation and the Bible on fermentation. Um, but you could basically just then juice your fermented vegetables in your juicer and I have an episode if I remember I'll put a link down below to that where I basically juice fermented cabbages or fermented sauerkraut I made and so I got basically sauerkraut juice which you could drink straight it was actually quite strong so I basically would use that as a flavoring agent for my dressings but you could just juice a bunch of fresh sauerkraut and then you could juice your other leafy greens with it as well so you have a basically a probiotic rich drink right that being said you know hey it's great to ferment your own produce at home generally the more types of different produce you get in there like cabbage garlic onions you know uh, red peppers the more different kinds of ingredients you put in there the more kinds of bacteria you should have in there theoretically because certain bacteria like certain foods much like we like certain foods than others so I'd encourage you guys to do a spectrum of different foods in addition you know like yesterday um, I had uh, you know for my one of my meals was basically uh, coconut yogurt mixed with like four packages of blackberries so I got a little fat with my blackberries to up, help me increase the uptake of my phytonutrients um, also get some probiotics in me and then when I was done I basically just swished around some coconut water in with that and then just drank that so that was kind of a liquid probiotic drink um, in addition I will make smoothies all the time generally any smoothie I make will have either leafy greens in my garden or like berries with maybe coconut water, maybe some other fruits for sweetness, uh, maybe some coconut meat for a little bit of fat. And I'll oftentimes put in like powdered probiotic powders, different ones that I use. I rotate the different brands and the different types because each kind of different probiotic powder has different strains of probiotics and I don't exactly know what my body needs. I just rotate them all so at least at some point or another they're going through me and if I'm providing a good home for those probiotics, they're gonna live with inside me and they're gonna flourish and I'm gonna have a nice diverse microbial population inside me. So, you know, that's the other reason why I eat lots of different foods because certain microbes like different foods and I try to always switch it up for my little microbes to keep them happy, all right? So hope that answers your question and shares my thoughts. Uh, Carlos Contreras, how is it possible to get B12 and omega-3 fatty acids on a raw vegan slash vegan diet? I'm not sure if supplements work. All right, Carlos, so B12 I talked about a little bit earlier in this episode. B12, I personally take a supplement. It would be possible to get B12 in nature if we drank out of you know, uh, lakes and streams that were contaminated 
with bacteria that didn't have the bad bacteria. I do not recommend drinking out of lakes or streams unless maybe you're in the middle of uh, somewhere where it's really totally uncontaminated and no planes have ever flown overhead, which probably is an impossibility unless maybe you're in some part of the middle of the Amazon. <laughs> so, um, so that's how we'd get B12 naturally. Um, you know, I have tried to fortify my garden soil with microbes that will make the B12. Maybe my plants will have B12 in them, or maybe if I don't wash them, I'll get some B12. But I'm not relying on that, okay? Uh, Omega-3s, that's fairly easy to get on a raw vegan diet. Um, you know, all the leafy greens behind me, I'm purslane coming up right now in my garden. Purslane, very high in Omega-3 fatty acids. So here's the thing. Animals don't make their own Omega-3 fatty acids. They are concentrators. They eat lots of, you know, greens and leafy greens. They get their omega threes, right? We eat lots of leafy greens, right? We can make, we could get our enough omega threes from them if we ate leafy greens. The challenge is once you start adding in fats in high volumes or certain kinds of fats, then your omega three to six balance can get out of whack, and then you may not be converting your omega threes into more complex forms of fats such as DHA and EPA. In addition, you need the intrinsic factor. For this conversion to happen that may, may people may or may not have which i don't really know and so i, I do take a dha and epa supplement um, you know just to ensure that i'm going to have enough DPA, dha and epa in my diet at present time i take the iwi brand you can get the sun warrior brand the iwi brand is uh, basically at sam's club for the cheapest price they have a few different versions of it but basically it's all the same it's farmed algae product with omega-3 epa and dha I take that irregularly because I also, you know, if we have enough omega-3s, our body will convert it, and if we have intrinsic, the intrinsic factor, we'll convert it. So I, would, I don't want my body to get lazy by always taking this DHA and EPA supplement, but, you know, I don't want to rely that it's coming in from my diet, even though I am paying attention to my omega-3 to 6 balance, and even though I'm paying attention, you know, my 3 to 6 balance was not where I would like it to be, and that would lead me to believe that most people that are just totally not paying attention to this, um, you know, and eating, you know, sesame seeds, almonds, or other nuts that are high in omega-6s on a regular basis, or even oils, then you guys are probably really out of bounds on that. Then you, it'd probably behoove you, if it was me, to, you know, I would take a EPA DHA supplement a lot more regularly in that case, and just get it from the supplement and not have to worry about your body converting it because your ratios are so whacked out. The other thing I'd recommend is everybody get an omega-3 test. So you guys can see where you're at and just have some awareness and try to improve your omega-3 status. So yes, so yeah, you I mean if you eat fish, you get omega-3s, but the fish didn't just make it automatically. They ate algae, and I just want to eat lower on the food chain. So, you know, cows would eat grass and other leaves for their omega-3s, and that's what I'm going to eat. That's why I juice a lot of leaves to concentrate the nutrients in the leaves so I could get more of them into me, and as well as I take algae that either made the EPA and DHA or just take algae uh, just because I'm eating lower on the food chain. And those are very nutritious foods despite, you know, having some uh, omega-3s in there, all right? Uh, and supplements, yes, they can work for sure. <laughs> I guess, you know, I can't say all supplements work. It depends on the specific supplements, right? Um, but yeah, I'd say in general, a good quality supplement can work. But there's a lot of scams out there too, so... <laughs> All right, Feral Fawn. What is a Japanese brand of electric toothbrush you use? Uh, you mentioned in one of your videos. All right, so it's actually technically not electric. It does have a solar panel, so it does use some kind of electricity to basically convert the titanium into, um, you know, some basically anti-bacterial um, properties. Releases ions in your mouth. I believe it works. Um, it's a Solade Three S O L A D E Y Three. Um, when you do purchase one, be cautious though on where you get it from. I've heard there are knockoffs and uh, you know it doesn't work like it once did because there's a lot of knockoffs and so make sure you get an original one. Next question is from a Pin Jarla. Could you share some thoughts on how to make sweets? I'm switching to a raw diet and the hardest part is to have some snacks that are similar to processed ones. Thanks, John. All right, so basically I'm gonna tell you that processed sweets um, you know even if they're raw I'm gonna definitely tell you guys are better than <laughs> non raw non vegan highly processed sweets you know um, that being said we really want to try to lose our sweet tooth that we've had since we've all been children because we've been fed so much freaking processed sugar 
we have such a high tolerance for sweets. So the best thing to do is not to, you know, fill in and substitute raw sweets for the cooked ones. That's definitely a step in the right direction, so don't get me wrong. Um, but the better thing to do is to lose your addiction to your sweets. We have an addiction to sweets in our taste buds, but I think we're just, we need to be overly stimulated for us to give us a, a kick or a high. And so I think the best way to do that is to check in to True North Health Center, um, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, and he'll basically, he'll do a water fast or a juice fast, whatever he determines is, is the healthiest. But basically once you get off those guys for like three weeks, two weeks, maybe even a week, I do not recommend water fasting on your own. Um, recommend it only supervised. Uh, basically your taste buds will reset, not only for the sugar, but also for salt and all the other foods that you're having a hard time giving up, right? It'll be significantly easier to give up these foods if you just basically get a reset, a reboot by doing a, a supervised water fast all right that being said you know i didn't take that route when i got into it although i have significantly lost my sweet tooth from how it was before i was raw but i still like some sweet stuff here and there so you know raw sweets it's just super simple i'm not going to say this is the healthiest because it's not but it's definitely better than like buying a chocolate bar right so the easiest way is just take some dates and some nuts put them in the food processor Grind them up together. I mean, that's also known as a Laura bar, or for those of you guys, before Laura bar came out, there was an NHU bar. That's a whole old school. I don't know if any of you guys you will remember the NHU bar, but basically, he made bars that were basically just fruits and nuts, basically food processed. You could put that stuff through a juicer. Basically, you're gonna mix the fats with the sugars, and then you're gonna get the same kick that the processed stuff would, but at least you're eating, you know, nuts and dried fruits. Now, those are high calorie, not the healthiest you know once again good better best you know if you, if you do make those things or buy lore bars which are basically fruits and dried nuts depending on the variety of lore bar because they also have some crappy ones now that have chocolate chips and other um ingredients that that i would not recommend anybody to eat um you could flavor it up with some cinnamon to like kick it up you could put other kind of you know dried superfood powders in there green powders fruit powders you know uh, berry powders, um, but that's the basic recipe. You could do, you know, raisins and Brazil nuts. You know, um, do I don't know different different kinds of nuts and fruits combined. And I always encourage you guys if you guys are using something like almonds or most nuts, always add some flax powder in there to help balance your omega three to six ratio. Um, that being said, you know, the, even better than the dried fruit and nut mixtures. Um, you know, which you should also take care of your teeth because those will stick to your teeth and yeah they don't digest the well uh, the best either because they're highly concentrated you really want to get a taste for sw fresh fruits right if you're having a sugar craving don't make those bars even though I just told you the recipe once again the bo those bars and making that recipe is better than eating you know a brownie or a cookie from a bakery or a, a candy bar but it's not better than eating fresh fruit right get some fresh juicy sweet mangoes it may be hard depending on where you live if you live in Florida and the season is actually probably starting about now um, you know you can have some amazing fruit that'll blow your mind that's so sweet you know that's rich with water content with all the different nutrients the sweetness that nature provide but also lots of different phytochemicals and phytonutrients and the water content it's me a lot better to eat and absorb keep you hydrated as well whereas the dried snacks that I mentioned will not right so there's a couple options for you um, you know I mean they have different raw desserts that start adding coconut oil to really kick up your flavor sensation because of the high fat and I do not recommend using any kind of oils um, in your different raw treats um, it just adds extra calories without a lot of nutrients so at least use nuts if you want the best kind of nuts to use I would basically sprout the nuts soak them sprout them then dehydrate them and then use those in your recipe you know I, I don't tend to eat a lot of those things a lot so you know I don't do that um, so much I guess the other the best other snack actually is what I kind of resort to these days for the most part is uh, freeze-dried fruits <laughs> so um, I did get off my freeze-dried habit of eating too many freeze-dried fruits because I did gain some weight because of all the it's calorie dense it also lights up your taste buds and makes you feel good because <laughs> it's uh, super concentrated but yeah freeze-dried fruits um, they're totally amazing and that's actually even that's not as good as fresh fruits, but better than that the, the dried fruit and nut mixture. All right 
So yeah, freeze-dried jackfruit tastes like fortune cookies. One of my favorite things, all right? So hope that helps you out there with a whole uh, summary of, of what I would do if I was in your situation. A couple different options, all right? Next question is from Akhil Holden. I'm totally confused by your confession that you have started a nutritive diet. I mean, even poisonous stuff has nutrients. Even cooked grains have nutrients. Why not stick with low-fat, raw, vegan? <laughs> All right. So, here's the thing, right? You know, I like to say I have a nutritarian, raw, plant-based diet, right? Um, you could be on a low-fat, raw, vegan diet, and you could eat, you know, dates, and you could eat romaine hearts, you could eat bananas, and you'd eat that, you could be called low-fat, raw, vegan, because you're eating low-fat, and you're raw, and you're vegan, right? That being said, I want you guys to make it a bit better, right? You don't have to eat cooked stuff, you could still be a nutritarian, you know, and eat nutrient-dense, raw, vegan food, so instead, if I was, you know, nutrient-dense, raw, vegan, what I'd eat instead of dates, bananas, and romaine, which is, you know, well, romaine's not super high calorie, but the other two are, and they just, they pack you on the calories. Well, hey, we need calories, and especially if you guys are into athletics and performance and doing marathons, you're going to need to eat more calories and not, uh, but you still, in my opinion, should add in some nutrient-dense foods. So, I mean, just simply by eating those items and adding in some, some blueberries, right? Blueberries, a little bit lower in calories than bananas, but they're a lot of higher in phytonutrients, you know? I often use berry powders. I have, you know, basically like cherry, uh, tart cherry, uh, freeze-dried that I could add to things. I have tart cherry concentrate I could add. I have uh, different kind of choke berry powders, aronia berry powders, maki powders, acai powders. These are all deep purple foods. These are highly nutritious and nutrient-dense, antioxidant-rich, something that bananas does not have. I still classify myself as a low-fat raw vegan, um, and also, I guess the, it depends on how you define low fat, right? Do you define low fat as 5% fat, 10% fat? You know, generally, I believe if you're calling yourself low fat, you should be below 25% to 20% uh, fat. So that's what I consider myself. So I consider myself still low fat raw vegan, but I'm not, well, I don't even say I'm vegan. I say I'm plant-based, excuse me. Um, but I want to add the phytonutrient rich food. So instead of doing like romaine lettuce, or even we would know that iceberg lettuce has probably less nutrition than romaine lettuce. Even a romaine lettuce, if you pick, you know, purple romaine or red romaine lettuce, that's more nutrient dense than standard green romaine, right? I would say my purple, uh, you know, uh, veined kale here, dazzling blue kale, is more nutritious than romaine lettuce, right? I have other deep leafy greens back here in my garden that I could eat that'd be more nutritious and that have different phytonutrients and phytochemicals than what lettuce would. Not to say that lettuce is bad. I juiced four heads of uh, iceberg lettuce this morning for my morning juice. But you know, kale has properties that lettuce doesn't have. Kale has anti-cancer properties. And if you're eating bananas and dates and romaine, yeah, there's some anti-cancer stuff in there. But if you want more anti-cancer power proven by science, you know, you got to eat some cruciferous vegetables and likewise every different fruit and vegetable in my garden and on the planet has a whole are, they're basically plants are basically chemical factories right they don't make chemicals out of man-made stuff they make chemicals from the sun shining on it from the nutrients the minerals in the soil the microbes in the soil interacting with the roots and basically they make chemicals based on the sugars that they're creating all kinds of stuff anyways they're making different nutrients and the plants make the nutrients uh, you know or the chemicals in there for the plants benefit right um, some of my plants like produce red leaves, right? The red leaves are kind of like if you're a person of color, right? Um, you, you know, sunburn is easy. The red leaves don't sunburn as easy, and those are additional nutrients, and when we eat, we get them. So, you know, I try to eat more, you know, higher nutrient dense foods in my diet. You know, I am still not a big fan of grains, although I did have a video on eating, uh, you know, like a this uh, special jazzberry rice which is high antioxidant you know I, I haven't even tried to eat it they sent me a couple pounds but I haven't even tried to eat that but I did eat some bloomed wild rice which is black yesterday to kind of have some variety in my diet feed my microbiome and also you know I'm not eating white rice I'm eating dark rice because it's antioxidant rich so every meal you guys have a choice you know instead of picking like a, a you know a golden delicious apple that's like you know kind of like more yellowish or green pick like a deep 
rich like Arkansas black apple, right? Because it's black, because it's, you know, not black, but dark red, there's more nutrition in there, antioxidants that are gonna fuel you, help your body to heal more effectively, in my opinion, and based on some of the data I've seen, uh, you know, also uh, cause you to age less because you're gonna have more of these antioxidant properties, right? I juice purple carrots as, whenever I could get them, um, you know, and always have my fridge stock with them unless I run out and I, I'm not able to find them because they're more nutritious than, you know, orange carrots or white carrots, for example, you know? So you could still eat low fat raw vegan, but make different choices, you know, eat more berries, you know, choose more antioxidant rich foods. You know, if you want to learn more about this, I would encourage you guys to check out a book or listen to Audible like I have many times. It's called Eating on the Wild Side. You will learn how modern day food has been basically lowered in phytonutrients and this can, in my opinion, cause health challenges and have us not be as healthy as we possibly can be. So. Um, I hope that answers your question, um, and yeah, I'm moving on. <laughs> All right, next question is from Jody Thuy. Thank you, John, for having a monthly Q&A video because I have so many questions. Number one, you travel a lot. How do you stay raw in Italy? Next, I have heard I have a hard time finding food. Most of the time I see pizzas and pastas. Oh, that's uh, number two. Can you do videos about vegan restaurants in non-English speaking countries? Thank you. All right, so. Number one, you travel a lot. How do you stay raw in Italy? So I went to Rome, uh, you know, that's Italy, <laughs> um, many years ago, and I, I did not do as the Romans do, <laughs> right? I didn't eat at restaurants, you know, because there's hardly any vegan restaurants, and I can't read the language. So where did I shop? What did I eat? Well, I shopped at farmer's markets. You know, most parts of Europe have better farmer's markets than most parts of the United States, in my opinion, because they have a really strong food culture, right? And, uh, you know, so I just shop at farmer's markets, eat the fresh produce out of the farmer's markets, you know, fruits and vegetables, and I, and I was happy with that, you know? I'd make little recipes. I have travel recipes that I could put together. Little salads. I'll get fermented foods. Depends on where I am in the world. You know, and then I, if I can't have farmer's markets, then sometimes I'll go to farms and buy things fresh at farms, like and visit farms and while I'm making videos there, which is really fun for me. And the next thing I do is I'll go to health food stores. Some countries have really expensive health food stores. So then sometimes I skip them and then I'll just go to the grocery store. So all the, every country you visit in the whole world, for the most part, that I've ever visited, they all have grocery stores. Now sometimes some grocery stores, like in Costa Rica, depending on where in Costa Rica you are, you know, the produce selection is ab 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 abysmal, <laughs> poor, and the quality is very bad, but nonetheless, they still have produce, and I always find the best produce item that they have to buy and eat. You know, we don't want to eat at restaurants when we're traveling. You know, you want to avoid that, because then you are at the mercy of whatever the chef or the restaurant is serving you to order. Um, you know, go out and make your own food. You know, I often will travel with the juicer. I bought in hand crank juicers when I went to Fiji. You know, I travel with, you know, sometimes when I go to a foreign country like Europe, I'll buy an inexpensive blender and buy it the first day I'm there so I can make smoothies and stuff. And then on the last day, I might leave it, give it to somebody or I'll bring it back. And then I'll put it on eBay, which I have done in the past and sell it uh, so that at least while I'm in the country I'm at, I have access to some equipment that maybe I didn't want to pack with me. I think that trip I was actually traveling only carry on. You can't take blenders on the carry on because of the blade, but I could take a juicer. But the problem with taking a juicer is the voltage in other countries are different, so your juicer's not going to work unless you have a very expensive, well, not super expensive, but heavy transformer. All right, so that's how I stayed raw in Italy. I stayed raw in, in, you know, Fiji, Costa Rica, Iceland, you know, the UK, Germany. I think Germany was snowing when I was there. But yeah, I mean, always stayed raw, no problem. Shop, egg, just eat produce out of grocery stores, not complex. Number two, can you do videos about vegan restaurants in non-English speaking countries? <laughs> so, number one, I don't regularly eat at vegan restaurants because I find vegan restaurants atrocious. Yeah, I personally believe that vegan restaurants, they serve, I, I think it's great that they're vegan and they're not killing animals, but I think it's hor horrendous and horrible that they're serving highly processed foods that are making people sick, right? Um, you know, vegan restaurants, in my opinion, should focus on having a whole food plant-based, even if it is gonna be cooked or heat processed. But even so, most of them serve all these processed, you know, fake meat, mock meat products and fake cheese products with all kinds of different additives, which are not good. So I will never make a video at 
vegan restaurants in non-English speaking countries. Uh, the other thing is I have ch I don't I don't speak any of their language in English, so it'd be also hard to decipher things. I have made videos at raw restaurants in other countries before, um, you know, and, and when I find some, I, I do make videos. But even then, I don't necessarily recommend going to that raw restaurant in the other in the foreign country to eat because in many cases it's been rare that I find actually healthy raw vegan restaurants to eat at. They may taste good, but they're, they're not the most health, you know, building in my opinion as compared to me eating out of the farmer's market, the farm, a health food store, or even the grocery store and making some simple meals when I'm traveling, all right? So hope that helps you out. Hope that explains my opinions on that topic. Uh, next question is from E. Dallo. What is your opinion on mono meal? So I think mono meals are great. I don't think anybody should necessarily live their lives only eating mono meals. I think that would get, you know, quite boring. Also, it would be kind of limiting on how much, on the variety you could eat, you know. I used to be more of a fan of eating more simply and for a period of time, all my recipes would be under six ingredients. But nowadays, I'll add more than six ingredients in my salads at night. But in the daytimes, generally, I keep my ingredient, uh, you know, uh, numbers down. So the, today I had like a juice, it had cucumber, um, pineapple, beet, and ginger, and maybe a little carrot. And then before that, I had a mono meal of basically just uh, iceberg lettuce juice. And then, uh, oh, then I had like my uh, freeze-dried salad that I that I made in January. Um, tastes just like I made it. Um, that was mostly greens. It was basically a blended salad, so greens, tomatoes, and some other things. And they had a few more ingredients. You know, I think one of the things I have with mono meals, if you're, you know. There's always going to be fat in anything you eat, but depending on what you're eating, you know, I might want a little bit more fat. So like if I'm eating like yesterday, I was going to eat a mono meal of blackberries. Instead of eating mono meal of blackberries, I added some coconut yogurt to it to up the fat content. So now I have a better absorption of the fat soluble nutrients in there. Although people may argue with me, we don't need to absorb more of the fat soluble nutrients. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that's your right to not do that if you don't want to. I, I think it can be helpful. Do I always do it? No, I don't. Sometimes I just eat blackberries but yesterday I combined the blackberries with coconut yogurt got the probiotics a little bit more fat and also you know made the uh, the blackberries that weren't optimally ripe taste better <laughs> all right so yeah so I would say mono meal should be part of your diet but it shouldn't be your own the only thing you eat in your diet you know I like to do mono meals usually maybe once a day although some days I'll you know I mean if I'm eating jackfruit I usually don't eat anything besides jackfruit like my morning juice is usually a mono juice whether it's celery Lately, I've tried to do just straight lettuce juices. It just depends, so I always switch it up, and that's my answer, all right? Last question today, Vincent Hermes. If you could choose just one crop to grow, what would it be? I always love these questions, like, if you go to some island, you know, what would you eat or something? If I could only grow one crop, though, man, that'd be tough. It's like, is this the only crop that I could eat for the rest of my life, or is it the only crop I'm gonna grow? <laughs> I mean, I grow so many different crops and they're all fun and unique in their own ways. Um, but if I had to say only one, I'd have to say I'm gonna grow a coconut. I mean, if that's the only crop I could grow, they're relatively low maintenance. Um, also, they provide the best filtered water on earth, basically from the coconut palm. They provide a source of fat in the young meat, which I like the most, or the mature meat, which I usually make into milk. They also provide coconut sprout, which is basically fluffy, cotton candy-like, um, or like angel food cake, sorry, like texture that's just totally amazing. Also, you can take the sap out of the coconut palm and um, dehydrate it into a, a sweetener. You could actually ferment it into a beverage. I mean, the coconut is probably one of the most useful plants on the planet. One of my favorite foods by far, and if I could only grow one thing, that'd probably be it, right? Because it's so versatile, right? Oh, and you could eat coconut heart of palm. So that's awesome. That's like a vegetable right there, coconut heart of palm. That being said, I would not be harvesting my coconut heart of palm for the heart of palm because it kills the tree. Um, you know, peach palms are a better palm to do that from. And if I remember, I'll post a link down below for a video where I cut down a peach palm and ate the heart of palm myself. All right. Hope that answers your guys' questions today. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you guys did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Also, be sure to share this video with somebody you think it might help. Also, be sure to click the link down below in the description and leave me a question for next month's Q&A. That will help me out a lot. 
Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss any of my new and upcoming episodes that come out every five to seven days. You never know where I'll show up or I'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Uh, finally, be sure to click the subscribe button right down below. Click the little bell so you get notified as my new videos come out. I think I just said that. <laughs> finally, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 500 episodes at this time I teach you guys all aspects on how to include more fresh fruits and vegetables and why you should do it in your diet because they, in my opinion, are the healthiest foods on the entire planet. So uh, with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.